The debate will begin with 10 minute opening statements from both Ryan and Alex. I will then ask both of our participants two separate questions where they'll have five minutes to respond with alternating one minute rebuttals. Thanks for taking two hours tonight uh, to learn about energy. I think this is one of the most important topics facing our country, uh, but it's also one of the most complex and confusing topics. So what I want to do uh, for my part is to really just focus on three ideas that I want to get across tonight. The first idea is that the green energy movement isn't trying to outcompete our leading sources of energy, it's trying to ban them. The second idea is that our leading sources of energy, whatever their problems, and there are certainly problems that exist, are both economically and environmentally indispensable. And the third idea is that support for green energy is rooted in ideology, not in economics or science. And I want to introduce these points with an analogy. Imagine that a medical activist group tried uh, to ban antibiotics. Why ban antibiotics? Well, they say antibiotics are, quote, dirty remedies. They have all kinds of problems. And some of the problems they cite are true. For example, antibiotics can make diseases stronger and more resilient. They can cause serious allergic reactions uh, and side effects, and so on. But what about the benefits of antibiotics? What about the fact that they've eradicated dozens of deadly diseases? Well, don't worry, the group says. These benefits can be replaced with more natural, greener remedies. Now, on this basis, would we buy this argument and ban something like antibiotics? Of course not. We would recognize that it is easy and common for people to attack good things by just focusing on their problems. It's easy to exaggerate problems instead of trying to solve them. And we know it's incredibly easy to make up a superior solution, in your imagination, that is. We would wish Green Remedies luck in proving their case voluntarily to consumers. But under no circumstances would we allow someone to ban something that in the full context is so crucial to human life. At least we wouldn't do that in medicine. In energy, my field, I believe the green energy movement is trying to do the equivalent of banning antibiotics. It is claiming, with no real proof or evidence, that green energy, so-called, mostly solar and wind, can power entire societies. And it is relentlessly attacking the only three proven practical sources of energy. Fossil fuels, nuclear, and you might be surprised, also hydroelectric. Now, some of these attacks are like in my uh, antibiotics example, based on real issues, such as coal plants emit undesirable pollutants. That is absolutely true. But many attacks are outright falsehoods, such as nuclear power plants cause cancer and genetic mutations. And many attacks revealingly have no clear connection to human health or well-being um, or economics, such as hydroelectric dams should be shut down because they interfere with free-flowing rivers, which is a really common justification given for opposing hydro. Now, notice that the whole focus here is negative. There's no focus on the positive benefits we get. Those are treated as, those are easy to get. We can switch out energies like we can switch out a light bulb. And on this basis, they're fighting for total bans or near total bans on our three crucial sources of energy. Now, take Al Gore, a leader of the green energy movement. In 2008, Al Gore claimed that he knew how to uh, produce power that was the equivalent of less than one dollar a gallon gasoline with solar and wind. Now, if he could actually do this, this would be the greatest energy breakthrough of the last couple of generations, and he would stand to make billions and billions of dollars as a business. But he didn't start a business. He didn't offer to start a business. The speech that he was giving, which was later signed as a petition by two million people, was a call for banning every single carbon-based source of electricity by the year 2018, which is now seven years from now. In fact, he implicitly called for a ban on virtually all forms of energy. Uh, the only forms of power generation that he endorsed were solar, wind, and geothermal, which combined, despite 40 years of subsidies, produced a meager and extremely expensive 2% of American energy. Now, Gore's plans and others that resemble it, such as, say, Barack Obama's plan to cap fossil fuels by 85% over the next se several decades, are taken literally catastrophic and they're unlikely to pass because of that. And the countries that have prom made promises like this in the past haven't followed through at all. But it's important to understand that to whatever extent these ideas 
make it into law, it will be disastrous, both for our economy and, it might surprise you, for our environment. If that seems implausible, it's because we've been taught to take modern life for granted. The world we live in is completely amazing. I mean, we live to 80 years old. That is historically unprecedented. And more important than that, what we can fit into a life of 80 years old is just completely staggering as well. I mean, look at what we have access to. Endless fresh food, clean water, racks of clothing, climate-controlled weatherproof shelter. The list goes on and on and on. I mean, this, is, this would be completely beyond the science fiction of the past. And because this is what we know, it seems guaranteed. But it's not. It can be lost, and that's for one reason. It's completely and utterly dependent on our ability to produce energy. Lots and lots and lots of cheap, plentiful, reliable energy. Now, our energy is our capacity to do work. And the more work we can do, the more productive we can be, the longer and happily we can live. The reason why people live really short lives historically is because they don't have much energy. They're just using their own muscles and animals. The incredible breakthrough uh, which was a tremendously difficult breakthrough, was to figure out how to harness the potentially unlimited ener uh, energy from nature and turn it into useful power. And that is an accomplishment so difficult that we've only been able to do it three times, basically. One is with fossil fuels, which uses concentrated plant and animal matter. One is with hydroelectric, which uses uh, large amounts of flowing water, although those don't exist everywhere. And nuclear power, which uses it with the power of splitting uh, an atom. Now, one of the most underappreciated benefits of energy is the environment that it produces. We're taught to think of our environment as something that starts out healthy and that we humans make dirty. That is the exact opposite of the truth. That nature does not give us a sanitary, clean environment to live in. And if you want to see this, just go visit a village in Africa that's living, quote, in harmony with nature. Try breathing the natural smoke of a natural open fire. Um, that's usually burning wood or animal dung, and this is a cause of 1.3 million deaths a year. It is really, really rough in nature. To live a truly human life, uh, we need to radically transform nature using industrial scale energy to make a big footprint and to create a truly human environment. Now, can solar and wind do all of these things? At this point, not even close. And the number one thing to pay attention to is not the technical arguments that we give, although I'm happy to talk about those uh, if you want, because I have no particular, uh, I, I have no animus towards solar and wind working. I would love them to work that. I would love any, any energy to work. But the fact is they have not been able to, in any country, even come close to generating a baseline of cheap, practical, reliable energy. And the basic problems for this, reasons for this technically, which I can elaborate on, uh, are called the diluteness problem and the intermittency problem. But bottom line, they haven't worked, and where they, where they are being tried right now, they're uh, leading to fuel shortages in Britain right now and near bankruptcy in Spain, which is paying about $275,000 per quote-unquote green job. Now, our response to the green energy hype should just be the same as it would be to green antibiotics. Prove it, if your idea is so good. But keep your hands off my livelihood. Uh, because billions of lives hang in the balance with energy production. In the past two decades, hundreds of millions of people have risen out of poverty because of fossil fuel production. Uh, 1.6 million people have clean drinking water that didn't even 20 years ago. Those gains will disappear if the practical energy underlying them disappears. If we pass green energy policies, we will have blood on our hands. Now, you might say, well, what about pollution? Absolutely, I want to be clear, we should have laws against pollution. But, but those need to be based on rational human considerations. So you have to recognize that at any stage of development, we're going to produce some waste. But the great thing is that over time, as technology advances, we produce a lot less of it. So the coal plants of two generations ago or 200 years ago are far dirtier than the ones of today, thanks to technology. But you can't have this ideal of no risk or no waste, because what that does is it causes you to shut down things that make, that make a 30-year difference in your life. Um, now, as far as climate change goes, I'll address that more later. The number one thing to know about climate change is that the proven thing that protects you from climate is industrial scale energy, which is why you probably haven't heard this, but deaths from climate related deaths in the last 80 years, despite global warming, have gone down by 80%. Uh, so, what this raises, I think, is 
why are people so hell-bent on solar and so against these other technologies? Uh, and that's what I'll address later on. And I look forward to everyone's questions. And Ryan, thanks for joining me. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Ryan Rittenhouse. I am with Greenpeace, uh, though I've been with, as she said, a number of other organizations in the past. Uh, and real quick, before I get started, I would like to let everybody know, if you didn't notice, there are some handouts in the back. Uh, I have a couple of great uh, student volunteers back there. There are free t-shirts for the Quick Coal campaign. If you want one of those, feel free to take one. Um, also, there's a sign-up sheet to volunteer with our Quick Coal campaign. If you would like to do that, we need as many people as possible. So thank you for coming. Um, a lot of what uh, Mr. Epstein said is uh, accurate. A lot of it, however, I don't agree with, as you might imagine. Um, for instance, to me, and being here at the, Obje at the Objectivist Society, it, it's really pertinent to talk about, I think, the role of personal responsibility and the idea of freedom and how this all interrelates to each other. To me, you're only, the only way we can maintain our freedom is if we are responsible for it. And that is, that is the basis of all society, of all laws, and of all governments. And if you are not responsible for the things you do, for the freedoms that you have that are protected by your fellow men, then you don't deserve to keep that freedom. The obvious example is if you murder someone, you should be put in jail. Your freedom is taken away. Well, the same is true in all aspects of life and all aspects of society. You are free to conduct business. You are free to pursue some kind of enterprise and some kind of thing that will benefit mankind. But if you are not held accountable, if you are not responsible for all the costs of that enterprise, then you need to be held accountable for it. And if you, what you do hurts people, then you should be punished for it. And the fact of the matter is, is that what we have seen over the past 200 years of industrial development is that, especially in the case of fossil fuels, they, the economists call it externalize, we say hidden costs, but they put out all of these other costs and make the public bear those costs. Sometimes the costs are individual human lives. So yes, it's great that you know, we were able to figure out how to burn fossil fuels and generate electricity, but the pollution from that electricity generation has led to a lot of pain and suffering. And the worst part about it is climate change, which we have only just begun to scratch the surface of. If climate change continues, the death and destruction and, and economic impact from fossil fuel generation will, that we have seen will look like nothing in comparison. We are talking, because it's not just about talking about sea level rise, we're talking about changes in growing patterns and growing seasons, and we're also talking about the greatest, one of the greatest mass extinction events in the history of this planet. There have been five, I think, and we're currently in the sixth, or there have been four and we're currently in the fifth. The whole billions of years that this planet has been in existence, there have only been a handful of mass extinction events. We are causing one right now. It's estimated that if climate change continues forward, about 90% of the species living on the planet will go extinct. So that, I mean, and it's kind of a big thing to try to wrap your head around, but for the purposes of this debate tonight, you should realize that that is going to have a very vast economic impact for human society. Because as much as we have separated ourselves from the natural world, we are still dependent upon it. And if it collapses, we will have a huge problem on our hands. And we are in the process of seeing that collapse. So what we get down to with talking about energy is basically a cost-benefit analysis, um, similar to what Alex was talking about. You have these sources of generation, and you have the drawbacks to them. And what you have to do is you have to weigh them against each other and say, well, is, is the uh, cost worth the benefit? And that's basically what we're driving at. The problem in this situation is, is that the people who are paying the, the direst cost are not those who are getting the benefit. And the people who are usually getting the benefit are not paying the biggest cost. And this is especially true in climate change. You know, you, a long time ago, when, when we first started generating power in this country, you had um, coal plants going up, and you also had people advocating for hydropower and things like that. And they first started building the first coal plants in cities. People didn't really know much about cancer and things like that back then, but they did realize that all this soot wasn't very sightly and it was making people cough, so they made them move them out of town. And what happened is that continued, and the in infrastructure grid for transporting electricity built up, and so now you have all of these electricity generating stations out in rural 
communities mostly sparsely populated, and these are the people that suffer most from the emissions from these plants. This is where you see cancer rates higher than anywhere else in the country. This is where you see asthma rates higher than anywhere else in the country. The list goes on and on. And these people oftentimes aren't even getting any power from those facilities. In the case of the Native American reservations where there are some really terrible coal mines and coal plants, they don't even have electricity and yet they're paying this huge cost of uh, deficits to their health and destruction to their environment right there in their community. So the other thing I'd like to address is uh, sort of this myth that's pretty prevalent uh, amongst industry that environmentalism is the same as uh, being a Luddite, you know, being someone who's against technology. This idea that environmentalists are all, you know, tree-hugging, granola-munching hippies that want to live in the woods and sit around campfires and not touch modern technology. And while there are some people that are like that, and I, there's nothing wrong with that, that is not what the green energy movement is about, nothing at all. In fact, we are the opposite of Luddite. We want to look forward and develop the new technologies of energy. This is about looking at what Alex said. Um, you know, like, like he said, we've been minimizing the impacts from our energy generation, but the reason we've been doing that is because of environmentalism. Because over the past three to four decades, environmentalists have been making a name for themselves and raising awareness in the public consciousness. The Clean Air Act didn't just happen because a bunch of politicians thought it was a good idea. It happened because environmentalists made it happen. And all of the advancements in uh, environmental regulations and pollution reductions happen because environmentalists and public health advocates have made them happen. And so instead of thinking of renewables as something totally separate from fossil fuels, you should just think of them as the next evolution. You know, nobody got too upset. You know, at one time we were all basing our transportation system on horses and buggies. But then the automobile was invented. Not a lot of people, except for the people that owned lots of horses and buggy uh, manufacturing facilities, complained about it because it was the next advancement in technology and it, it posed obvious benefits to all of society. And now you don't really see horses carrying buggies around unless you hang around Amish country a lot. So that is kind of the same thing going on here. You have this renewable energy that does exist that exists now, we have this technology now, it's up and running in many places, and it is so much cleaner and doesn't have these hidden costs that fossil fuels have. So that is the logical place to go. And the way you make the transition is you stop investing your infrastructure in this fossil fuel stuff, and you start investing it in clean renewable energy. We, the, the, uh, the cost of solar, for example, has consistently come down, I think, by about 30% every year for the past 30 years. It's made amazing progress. You know, we're not in the same situation as we were when Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House. The technology exists now, and as far as subsidies go, subsidies are for new technologies that need the investment. And when you actually look at the overall subsidies that have been given to energy over the years, the amount of money given to fossil fuels completely dwarfs any money, all of the money that has been given to all renewables combined. And nuclear, at one point, when it was first starting, comprised 1% of the entire United States budget, the entire budget, not just subsidies for energy, the entire American budget, 1% went to nuclear subsidies. So this is not really an issue for me, this issue of subsidies. We should be investing in these new technologies, and we should be scaling back our subsidies in these old technologies that should have their infrastructure well in place and shouldn't need these subsidies anymore. Um, so yes, that's basically the point is uh, we are for modern technology, not pollution. And the obvious choice to go here is instead of continuing to try and patch on these uh, technologies to failing and aging coal plants, we should be switching our infrastructure to these new sources of energy that don't need in, uh, these pollution control devices because they're inherently far, far cleaner. And I think, uh, oh yeah, the one last point I'll make, I have about 30 seconds left, is that um, fossil fuels are running out. They will run out, they are running out. This is not something that we can keep doing even if we wanted to. We have to make this transition. And the question is, are we just going to sit around and wait to make the transition naturally 
uh, in terms of the way the economy forces things? Or are we going to realize that we need to get a hold of this because of climate change and speed up this transition? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I mentioned at the beginning that this can be a, a really complex issue. And I think Ryan probably brought up about two dozen factual claims that, that none of you have um, much access to and probably haven't studied the literature on. Uh, I have, so if, if you want to ask about any of those specific claims, uh, please take advantage of the question period to do so. But I think even just knowing what you know from our two statements and from your general knowledge, um, some things should seem to be off in what you're hearing. And I want to start with this issue of hidden costs. So we heard that, OK, there's, there was this industrial revolution, and we didn't account at all for the hidden costs uh, you know, of, of people getting sick from coal smoke. And certainly, people did get sick to some extent uh, from coal smoke. But what was missing from that whole discussion, and what unfortunately is missing from every single green discussion I've ever heard of this issue, is the fact that during that period, the life expectancy doubled, that the human environment got immeasurably better. So you can't condemn the technologies that work by reference to a fantasy world that generates no pollution. So it's, it's hypocritical to say, oh, I'm, I'm concerned with these hidden elements, when the huge thing that's being ignored is the hidden benefit. I mean, the benefit that we've gotten from fossil fuels uh, in the past and today is enormous. What's the benefit when gasoline takes you to the hospital? What's that worth? Is that factored into the price? So there's this whole pseudo-economic idea that somehow the price is supposed to reflect this exact value to society of everything, which is a very big misunderstanding of prices. But the, the thing I want to point out here is that, the, as I said at the beginning, the positives are completely being ignored. The positives are life and death. And all we hear is negative, 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 with this promise that, well, the technology is here. Well, if the technology is here, then why is it economic nowhere? To say the technology exists, it just means someone can generate some power in a lab. That's different from running your mother's respirator in a hospital with a network full of windmills, which has never happened. And if uh, there's no evidence it can happen at all, or, or certainly that it can't happen economically. Now, we heard also um, projections of climate change. This is also an issue where even if you don't know all the specifics, you can be suspicious. And when someone basically tells you that an apocalypse is coming, based on what we've done so far, even though what we've done so far, so far has led to a dramatic increase in human well-being, you should be suspicious. And you should ask them, well, what exactly do you mean that, like, what is your evidence that global warming is catastrophic? Because you might, is the globe warming? Yeah, sure. Is there a greenhouse effect? Yeah, but if you look at the greenhouse effect in isolation, it actually leads to what's called the logarithmic uh, growth in uh, temperature, which basically means that the more CO2 you use, it's kind of like this. It sort of tapers off. It's not that big a deal. So what he's talking about depend on basically the Al Gore hysterical Hollywood version uh, of science. And that, that should be very controversial. And also you should ask, so we're supposed to abandon it all on, on Al Gore's judgment of the scientific future? Because there are many people who say, well, there's lesser global warming. It's not going to be that big a deal. So that's another issue. And then one final one. I mentioned the issue of one of the that two of the three practical sources of energy are CO2 free. That is nuclear power and hydropower. Now hydropower is inherently limited by the number of sites that can have water. But nuclear power has no such limitation. So why is, if, if climate change is an apocalypse and there's one proven source of power that can create it and the idea that we're anywhere near running out of that uh, is so far beyond a joke. I mean, it's, we can talk about resource economics later, but we're far from running out of fossil fuels. I mean, thousands and thousands of years using existing nuclear technologies. So you're going to hear about mutations. And I heard Ryan say online you know, that it's going to, your kids are going to be mutants in effect. This is all complete pseudoscience. Um, and if the environmentalist movement really cared about cheap, effective energy, it would be damn sure there were problems with nuclear power. This is the safest, if you look at the statistics, this is the safest form of energy power conversion ever converted. It generates no emissions. In the 1970s, it was cheaper than coal. It was on a path to dramatically lower CO2 emissions. If that's your focus, the number one organization that destroyed it, Greenpeace. I say they have a lot of explaining to do.
Um, the first main issue that he, Alex addressed was uh, this idea that fossil fuels are to blame or rather to get credit for the extension and lifespan of, of human beings. And I have to take a lot of issue with that because a lot of other things happened during the Industrial Revolution than just the advancement of fossil fuel as being used as energy. Uh, advancements in medicine, advancements in agriculture, advancements in the quality of life everywhere in all aspects of our society and our technology are what is to blame for that. The fact that we were using as fuel for electricity, in some places coal, and that we were starting to use for transportation oil, I don't really see how you can claim that the entire credit for the expansion of human life during that time is to be given to fossil fuels. That makes no sense to me. Um, I would rather say that the advancement of technology and the scientific enlightenment and things of that nature are what led to the uh, extension of the human lifespan and the increase in quality of life. Because the fact of the matter is, is like I said, this is an example of those who get the benefit aren't paying the highest cost. Because if you want to look at terrible places to live, Look at history and look at the historical accounts of London during the Industrial Revolution. The air was so black with soot that you couldn't see anywhere. It wasn't the fog, it was the soot. So the poorest people were still living miserable, awful lives. They were having to work in factories, um, you know, and this led to labor laws and all sorts of other things. Uh, so the, the extension of human life, I mean, that, that is more the advancement of technology in general. I don't see how you can claim that it's all the credit of energy, nor do I see how you can claim that transitioning off of that fuel will somehow damage that way of life. We have these alternate sources of energy, and no matter what Alex says, they're completely viable now. Uh, you, Texas is uh, the leader in the world right now in wind energy. Uh, it's small scale now still, but it's growing. And if we continue to encourage it, it will continue to grow. And there's no reason to say that it can't take over in general. For something like a hospital, there's something called combined heating and power. Large facilities like that have specific needs that are a little different. And there's a way forward on that uh, in the meantime before we have a major grid operating on renewables. I can talk more about that later, but I don't want to take up too much time on that right now. Um, my evidence that global warming is catastrophic is that the entire world scientific community has told me that it's catastrophic. Also, I am not Al Gore. At least last time I looked in the mirror, I was an Al Gore. I hope I'm a little better looking than he is. Um, I'm not a very huge fan of Al Gore. Um, his movie was OK. Uh, but like Alex said, uh, it was a bit sensationalist in parts. Um, mostly factually accurate, but very sensationalist. Um, what I would say more about that is that <sighs> climate change is a huge huge problem, but it's a slow problem. It's, it's a geologic problem. It's a generational problem. You know, it's not like a meteor's heading to the Earth, and if we don't act, we have this very real instant in time in which it's going to hit us and kill us all. That's not climate change. Climate change is slow in the human experience. And it's not that the climate hasn't ever changed in the past. Obviously, of course, it has. At one point, the Earth was a molten ball of magma with no atmosphere. Um, the issue is, what is the rate at which it's changing? And what does that mean for human civilization? What does that mean for our society? And that's the issue, is because instead of the climate changing over thousands of years, like it normally does, we're forcing a change over a, 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 a couple of hundred years. And that's the big problem. Um, finally, and I only have 60 seconds left, but the nuclear power issue. Um, I don't have a lot to say on nuclear power. I did say that fossil fuels are running out, not that nuclear power is running out. The main problem with nuclear these days is cost. And I'm sure Alex will probably say that it was cheap back then. But actually, the, the main reason as much force and as much progress as environmental groups made stopping the nuclear development of power plants, the main thing that killed it was cost. It is an extremely expensive technology even today, and that's regardless of anybody interrupting the activity or you know, causing any problems. It's the most expensive form of energy. 
the, it, right here in Texas, you had people advocating for the expansion of the SDP nuclear project. And it was a huge scandal in San Antonio because they and NRG had told the city, and I'm sorry, my time's up, I'll just wrap up the sentence, had told the city that it would only cost $5 billion. In reality, and they knew all along, it was going to cost at least $18 billion, and the real price tag is probably more like 22. So that's the main problem with nuclear energy. The first question is for Alex. What technologies, if any, should the government ban or restrict, and how should it go about doing so? What technologies, if any, should the government subsidize or promote, and how should it go about doing so? Uh, so as much as possible, you want energy to be like computers. Someone has a good idea, they get to try it. If it's good, they win. If it's not, no harm done. The problem with forcing ideas on people, such as with any of these green energy plans, is A, we have all evidence that they're wrong, but B, we have no recourse if they're wrong. So if they're wrong and they try to compete on anything resembling a free market, it doesn't hurt you. I mean, maybe you'll buy some expensive solar panels. But if they do anything like restrict 85% you know, of fossil fuels or something like that, if they keep shutting down nuclear, if they keep shutting down hydroelectric dams, that literally means you cannot get the power that you need. So the, abs the fundamental policy of the United States government toward energy should be uh, a free market. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this requires specification in terms of something like pollution. A free market is a, is a market of people with individual rights, including property rights. So you have a right, um, you have a right to produce energy, but you also have a right to your property, to your air, to your water, and to preventing others from contaminating those things. And the way to deal with such issues is through the law. But as I mentioned uh, before, there can be none of this kind of infinitely clean standard that, you, that, at, certain, that at an early point in history, say, you, uh, you can't, you're not allowed to use coal because, well, there's smoke that makes people sick. Well, if something is fundamentally necessary to human survival, then you can't make it against the law. Because by that logic, you should have banned the first man from making fire because he was getting sick from the smoke. And surely the smoke taken in isolation was not beneficial to him. But the net benefit was incredibly positive. Uh, and with that, I want to address uh, further this issue of what I call hidden benefits. Uh, because what Ryan said uh, about energy being a kind of, you know, just one of many issues or a kind of peripheral issue with regard to human life expectancy, uh, I think that is, exhibits a real misunderstanding of the fundamentality of energy in human life. So he mentioned agriculture, and I think that's a good thing to mention, agricultural advancement. Well, what, in the 1970s, um, groups, including Greenpeace, were saying, you know, we had a population explosion, we need to lower the population, uh, we can't possibly feed the world. The population back then was 3.5 billion people. Now, what is the population now? It's 7 billion people, and they're better fed. Why are they better fed? Two basic reasons. Natural gas-based fertilizer, which made possible what's called the green revolution, although it's a very different kind of, of green. And then oil-based machinery, the type of machinery that with one modern uh, combine harvester, you can reap the wheat for 500,000 loaves of bread a day. So energy is the fundamental thing that amplifies any human ability, anti-human technology, any, any human technology. So whether you're looking at medicine, um, whether you're looking at uh, high tech, at every single stage, energy is involved. You need energy to mine the materials. You need energy to chemically uh, or, like, or uh, heat and process the materials. You need energy to transport the materials, uh, to put them together, to transport the finished product. Energy is everywhere. It is the, what Julian Simon, the economist, called the master resource. It is the resource that makes everything else possible. So you have to be concerned in a life and death way about do we have uh, energy? And should, how, what about this issue of transitioning? Well, yeah, we transition all the time. We transition from you know, Windows to Mac. We transition from other things. But a transition is properly a fr and only practically a free process. Because what happens is the individuals in the market, based on all the information that's reflected by the prices of different things, decide, OK, how much is there of this? How much is there of that? How practically can we make solar? How practically can we make nuclear? And based on that information, it does forward-thinking plans. 
Now people say, wow, God, the market is so short-sighted, we need the government involved. Really, the market is short-sighted? I mean, if you go to your gasoline station, every single time you go, you might not like the price, but because the price can go up and down, you can get gasoline reliably. Um, it's, it's just really staggering, actually, how forward-looking uh, the market is. So when, when prices go up and when other things like that happen, that's the collaborative intelligence of all of us, all the producers and all of the consumers saying, this is how, what resource we have to produce, this is, this is what we want, and it's this combined intelligence that leads to these uh, amazing results. So what the government needs to do in energy as much as possible is get out. Now it's very entrenched in various ways in the electrical grid, but as much as possible it should, it should act like a private participant who demands the best value for the best price, reflecting rational, respecting rational laws against pollution. So a, a perfect example of what happened recently in the news with uh, Solyndria. Yeah, I'm sure of hands who's heard of Solyndria. Most people. So that's an example of subsidies and the government being involved in energy development. An important thing to remember about Solyndria is the amount of subsidies given to that company is a fraction of what was given to all renewables. And the amount of money given to all renewables is a fraction of what was given to all energy. The majority of it went to fossil fuels. So again, this is the idea behind subsidizing things, is you have to expect that you're going to lose out on some of these things. The reasons why Solyndria failed were because they had uh, assumed that the price of uh, silicone would remain high. It didn't. Because of advancements in solar technology and a bunch of other solar companies being very successful, it actually brought the cost of uh, silicone down. So that is why Solyndria failed. It's because all the other solar companies were doing extremely well. Um, so actually the failure of Solyndria is actually a uh, sign that the, solar mar that the solar companies are doing actually quite well overall. So as far as the government goes, um, if you are going to have subsidies, um, you should definitely give it to the new technologies that need it because they are, do not have economies of scale to help support them. In terms of continuing to support fossil fuels, I don't really see the point in continuing subsidies to an industry that's been around for over 100 years. It doesn't make any sense. At the very least, they should uh, even the playing field and give the same amount of subsidies to all energy generators. Right now, like I said, most of it's going to fossil fuels and, and nuclear. Um, so that's, that's the main issue with that. Um, as far as transportation goes, not electricity generation, um, it's uh, because Alex spoke about that a little, and I know I shouldn't be getting into response yet, but um, what we're, what's that? No, you can respond. It's my five minutes. Okay, all right. Um, what we're, we're not against, like he said, you know, like uh, combines or grain harvesters. Uh, that's not what the issue of the green energy revolution is about. What we're talking about is the transition of the average American commuter who drives 30 miles a day in a car that burns fossil fuels. That is the number one source, that and trucks, of burning fuel for transportation in the country. That is what we're addressing, and that is what we need to change. And we have the technology now to make battery-operated cars that can go 90 miles a day on one charge and take commuters to and from work without using any fossil fuels, assuming you power it with an electricity grid powered by renewables. So that is the main issue. Yes, oil has many, many different uses. And we, are, we would not advocate for the government to suddenly come in and, you know, we're not on some crusade against a great Satan called oil. You know, it's, that's not the way it is. We're not, we're not advocating for the government to shut down all oil production and all uses of oil. Like I said, it's about making a transition off of burning most of this oil. And if we do that, we'll save so much more oil for all these other purposes and for future generations if they need it for things. So that's the main issue, and, and that's the main issue with electricity generation as well, is if the government is going to be involved, then they should be supporting new innovation and new development, and sometimes, like Solyndria, you're going to fail, and, but most of the time, you're going to succeed. For the most part, I'm fine with them scaling back, uh, because that would mean that the fossil fuel industries would have to go for it on their own dime, instead of leeching, up, leeching off of the public. Uh, I wish Ryan had elaborated more on the specific bans uh, that he and Greenpeace are in favor of, because it's very easy to say, oh, we want this positive transition, but you really have to talk about what are you going to prohibit individuals from doing, and what's your answer if you're wrong. As far as subsidies go, 
abolish every single one. Now, he and I are going to disagree. You don't have access to this literature on what's the most subsidies. Absolutely, per unit of energy, so-called renewables are far and away the most. But here's one thing to think about just in terms of your own knowledge. Subsidies aren't just in the US. They're around the whole world. And yet in every single country, green energy needs them and, and proves itself incapable of generating energy on a societal scale. So is every single country biased against green energy and in favor of fossil fuels and nuclear? That seems exactly contrary to all of their rhetoric and everything that gets them elected. And in fact, there's no conspiracy. They're very in favor of green energy. Unfortunately, reality is not. The second question is for Ryan. How do you account for the externalized or hidden cost of energy generation? So we've, up, we've obviously talked a lot about that already. Um, so to recap, I'll just say that um, obviously this is something that is mostly completely ignored by industry, this issue of hidden costs. Um, and it is quite extensive. Um, for instance, like Alex said on a video online, I talked about genetic mutations from nuclear uh, power. My, what I was saying in that video was not that you need to be very concerned that there are nuclear plants everywhere because all our babies are going to turn into mutated freaks. It's not what I was saying. What I was talking about was the effect that nuclear waste can have on unborn fetuses. If a pregnant woman is subjected to uh, nuclear radiation, that can, what that does is that can mutate your DNA. It can mutate the very fabric of who you are. And that is a generational problem. You will, your children will pass that down to their children and their children and their children. It literally alters what defines us as a species. So even though it may not be a problem that is very pressing in the sense that it's happening, like for instance, asthma from coal plant pollution is happening, it is a threat that exists from nuclear waste. And we have still, after all these decades of the industry claiming, oh, we have solutions to this waste problem and we, you know, te technology will save us and we'll figure out a solution eventually. We still do not have a solution. And to this day, every single nuclear power plant in this country stores all of its radioactive waste on site. So every single power plant is storing radioactive waste there on the site, just like Fukushima was doing. So that's a big problem. And I don't like being labeled a fear monger, so I try not to do that sort of thing. But there's a difference between fear mongering and acknowledging dangerous situations. And this is a dangerous and completely unnecessary situation because nuclear is way too expensive. It's a, sm it's a relatively smaller part of our energy mix anyway. And even if we wanted to, it could never replace the kind of generation we're talking about. It takes too long to build the plants, it's way, and it's way too expensive. And fuel may end up becoming a problem if you tried to do that, because it's very hard to mine the uranium. There's, there's not a lot of it. It's, uh, you know, you don't need much of it because we're talking about fission. But it is not an easy process, nor is it a clean process. Right here in Texas, you have uranium mines down in uh, southeastern Texas. And these uranium mines are not properly regulated because people around there have their groundwater being contaminated with radiation poisoning. The, the yellow cake is made there on the site of these mines, and there is residue from that. They dump it in uh, waste, uh, either uh, some type of containment pond or some other type of containment facility, and the drilling process for uranium mining is contaminating drinking wells in that area. The same thing, I can introduce you to some of these people who live near there if you want. There are, the same thing is happening on Native American reservations. Uh, unfortunately, we're still continuing to externalize a lot of these costs on Native Americans as well. Um, and finally, of course, uh, the biggest externality is this issue of climate change. And uh, again, it's because the people in charge and the people who are getting the most benefit are not the ones who are going to have to pay the biggest cost. And it, this goes, this becomes an exponential uh, scale when you're looking at global warming because we're talking about island nations that are only a meter high, which will be completely swallowed by rising sea levels and entire communities will be displaced. What's the economic impact of that? What's the economic impact of an entire nation going away? What's the entire economic impact of practically the whole country of Bangladesh being swallowed by the Indian Ocean? What's the economic impact of the Himalayan, Himalayan glaciers melting and suddenly two-thirds of the world's population not having access to fresh drinking water? 
These are the kinds of questions that aren't really being considered by industry. They just shrug their shoulders and say, well, our benefits are so obvious, we'll just deal with those problems when they arise. Well, the fact of the matter is, they aren't the ones that are going to have to deal with the problem. We're the ones that are going to have to deal with the problem. The rest of the world, the people in the other countries are going to have to deal with the problem. And the fact of the matter is, other countries are beating us now. China is starting to, to overpass us. Germany is making huge investments in solar. They have a, a scaled project in uh, the Sahara Desert they want to do, where the, theoretically you could build enough solar panels in the desert to provide enough energy to power the entire world. And with all of this with very little externalities or hidden costs of any kind. So when you're talking, if you're going to talk honestly about the economic impacts of energy generation, I don't see how it's responsible to ignore all of these very substantial costs that we may not deal with personally, but that the rest of the world has to all the time. Um, I want to read you an account of a, a truly dirty form of energy that I uh, read about, um, and it's a first-hand account of a guy who visited a dirty energy site. Quote, the foul-smelling radioactive waste from this industrial process is pumped day after day. The lake instantly assaults your senses. Stand on the black crust for just seconds and your eyes water and a powerful acrid stench fills your lungs. For hours after our visit, my stomach lurched and my head throbbed. We were there for only one hour, but those who live in Mr. Yon's village of Dalahai and other villages around breathe in the same poison every day. Dalahai villagers say their teeth began to fall out, their hair turned white at unusually young ages, and they suffered from severe skin and respiratory diseases. Children were born with soft bones and cancer rates rocketed. Can anyone guess what type of dirty energy this is from? Uh, this is from the materials used to build green wind turbines. So, as I said, there's a dissonance between what Greenpeace and the environmental movement claims to care about and what they actually support. So they talk about this magically clean energy and, and falling solar and wind prices. Well, that's very exaggerated in terms of the facts, but part of the reason those prices are falling is because they're externalizing their costs, to use that terminology, to extremely uh, dirty places in China that have no proper anti-pollution uh, laws. So if you're using that windmill, you're doing it uh, partially at the expense of Mr. Dalahai with modern technology. Now, why are they so indifferent to that? And again, with this issue of hidden benefits, I'm just shocked that no one is in awe of the fact that using fossil fuels, we doubled the human life expectancy, and that billions of people's lives have been impacted positively in the last 20 years. That just seems like something that gets thrown out so easily in favor of an incredibly sophisticated weather prediction that is believed to be so <laughs> catastrophic that we can't handle it, despite the fact that over the last 80 years we've demonstrated we're like 50 times better at handling the weather. So there's just this dissonance. And then nuclear power, it's so easily shrugged off, and we hear about the possibility uh, of someone getting, I mean, what does that mean? If you stick a mother in the middle of a nuclear reactor and drop her in, yeah, you're going to get in, in big trouble. But in terms of these nuclear reactors, nothing like that ever happens, which is why you don't hear about it, which is why you don't have a bunch of mutants walking around France, even though they get 60% of their energy uh, from nuclear sources. So none of this works. The con you can't be concerned about the environment and so hostile to fossil fuels. You can't be concerned uh, about CO2 and not and be so hostile to nuclear power. Now, as for the costs, this, this I find, this is also something that I think a little bit of looking for contradictions can help you detect. Now, we hear that, OK, this movement is incredibly anti-nuclear, but the thing that really defeated nuclear was the price went up. Well, why, do pri why did the price go up? It wasn't because nuclear fuel became very expensive. It's, it's still very, very cheap. It's precisely because the environmentalist movement made it nearly impossible to build a plant. We hear that it takes longer to build a plant. Did the construction industry become incompetent all of a sudden? No, it's the government getting in the I mean, I'm laughing, but it's really sad. The government gets in the way. It can take 20, 25 years to do one of these things. There's been such a stagnation in innovation because there's this, this idea that nuclear power is somehow fundamentally scarier than everything else, whereas all the evidence is that it's much safer because it leads to no one has died from a modern nuclear power plant due to radiation. That is the most amazing 
safety track record. That's much safer than a hydroelectric dam, which can explode and kill 50,000 people. Much safer than a fossil fuel plant. Safer than windmills, which have killed like, I don't know, 38 people in the last couple decades while producing uh, very little energy. So in the 70s, um, when we were less technologically advanced, nuclear power uh, was cheap. Green energy has never been cheap. It's never scaled. Nuclear power, whether it's the best thing or not economically, could scale as much as you wanted. The fact that that potential is ignored, the fact that fossil fuels are damned and banned, the fact that our entire standard of living is being put on the line in favor of a completely empty promise that won't put itself on the free market is, in my view, a tragedy and something that should be um, really, really questioned and ultimately rejected. As far as nuclear goes, uh, Chernobyl, I hope you all have heard of that. That uh, was a pretty catastrophic event. But, what's that? Not a modern plant. Doesn't matter, it was still nuclear power, and it killed a lot, of, and killed and harmed a lot of people. And there have been incidents in the United States, I can talk more about that later, but I don't have time to talk about them all now. Um, weather is not climate. That is a very common misconception. It is a uh, climate change denier myth, thinking that weather is the same thing as climate. It is not. Most of the advancements Alex is talking about is, de is you know, responsive type things, um, dealing with flooding, dealing with hurricanes, dealing with tornadoes, and re responding to that and saving people's lives. It has nothing to do with controlling the climate in the sense of climate change. It's two totally different issues. Um, also, of course, the thing he said about the people suffering in China from the stuff going to uh, wind turbine manufacturing, of course that's terrible. You have the same thing in any construction materials. We do not support that kind of thing. We want to see sustainable practices with the construction material. What we are talking about is when you're actually generating the electricity, those externalized costs, and when you take those into account, green energy is now cheaper than any of the current industrial technologies. Thank you. The questioner is asking if Ryan can elaborate specifically on how the green energy transitions will work and what the government's role will be. What we're advocating for is not to shut down all coal plants tomorrow and suddenly be able to replace them with green energy. The way we do it is by deciding where our investments go in terms of new infrastructure. So like I see the Build Keystone XL shirt right there. Um, that's a perfect example. It's when we make decisions about new investment, what are we going to make those new investments in? Are we making them in fossil fuels? Or are we going to make our new investments in renewable energy? So we still have time to avert the worst effects of climate change, and we have enough time to do a transition, a just transition, to green energy. But if we keep delaying it like we are, and we keep listening to the industry naysayers who say, oh, we can't do it, it's impossible, then we're not going to do it, and then suddenly we'll be in kind of a crisis situation. But right now, we still have the time, and it's, and like, again, it's not an instantaneous thing. It's plant by plant, it's development by development. But the point is, is we, at the same time, should not allow the continued investment in old, in old styles of technology. So for instance, building the Keystone XL pipeline or building new coal plants. We should spend that money, that new infrastructure money, on green development and green technologies. And if we do that, we'll, we'll make the transition over the next decade or so. I think it's important to understand the scale of what we're talking about. As I mentioned, um, these so-called green energies produce a very expensive 2% of our energy. Energy is basically the biggest industry in the world. In America alone, you're talking a multi-trillion dollar industry uh, for oil. And what all of these quote plans come under is what's called central planning, which if you read 20th century economic history was basically the thing that brought down uh, the Soviet Union and every other uh, socialist country. So, like a group of a couple of people or smart people can't, I mean Greenpeace has this very elaborate central plan for the future of the energy world. This is not how progress is made. Progress is made by the sum of millions of intelligent individuals on the market figuring out what is actually going to work uh, given millions and millions of different uh, variables that are involved. And it's, I, I just can't even begin to communicate how, how much of, of just an arbitrary thing it is to replace all of these practical things with things that have never worked. So when I say never worked, I mean they have never produced cheap, reliable energy on the scale of a country. What they have done is they have served as what I would say parasitical energies. Because they come in intermittently, because they're expensive, what you can do, one energy expert who used to work on these things all the time told me it's kind of like chocolate. You know, you can have a little in your diet, but if your whole diet is chocolate, you're going to get super sick. Well, following that analogy, it's a lot more dangerous than eating chocolate 
uh, all the time. But these are, these are not at all um, viable uh, technologies. Now, if we talk about what well, we shouldn't court, let invest in old technologies, first of all, what do you mean we? I mean, what if people decide that they need fossil fuel energy? China and India, as I said before, 400%, 300% increases in fossil fuel energy in the past couple decades, making possible a radical increase in standard of living. I read the other day, like, the average Indian woman's life has increased by six years. You're saying take that six years away from her because I claim that I can make sunbeams and wind gusts power the world. Well, no one has ever given any evidence that's been done. So again, do it freely. Abolish all subsidies and compete on the free market. But that's, that's what people refuse to do. So um, I mean, in terms of anyone writing a PowerPoint plan about how they're going to fix the energy economy of the world, that should be th that's much more arbitrary than the person who says, uh, you know, the guy who says in class that he knows a better iPhone, but he just needs a billion dollars in funding. The questioner is asking Ryan why he opposes nuclear power, given that historically the dangers of nuclear power have been very low, and given that nuclear power causes very little pollution. Um, in terms of, I mean, you're absolutely right in terms of the amount of radiation you get living next to a nuclear plant compared to, uh, like, flying in an airplane. Assuming that the, coal, that the nuclear plant operates completely as it should, assuming there's no accident or incidents. In terms of accidents that have happened, I encourage you to research French nuclear reactors and the spills that have happened in France. You may not have heard of them. It's because our media doesn't cover them. Um, there have been a number of spills contaminating, not spills, but leaks, contaminating groundwater in France. Uh, some villages have to have all their water brought in through bottles because their, uh, their local water is radioactive. There was an incident uh, outside of Chicago, south of Chicago, with a nuclear plant out there. Um, that contaminated people's drinking water. Um, but you won't hear about it because it's been hushed up. The people that uh, were harmed by it were threatened by the company. I actually went up there myself and interviewed some of them. And they later asked me within two weeks, I think, to destroy the footage and never show it because they were under threats from the company. And I'm not going to mention their names for the same reason. But that's the kind of thing you're dealing with with nuclear energy. So, I mean, you're right in terms of CO2 emissions. It's far, far less from nuclear energy than it is obviously from uh, coal or even natural gas. Um, it's estimated that the CO2 emissions from the nuclear process are about a uh, third to a fifth of what a, an average natural gas plant is. Obviously, they're not putting anything out of the stack, but the actual process of you know f developing the fuel and all that is about equivalent to about a third of a natural gas plant. Um, for instance, the uranium enrichment facilities are powered by huge, massive coal plants. So in order to enrich the fuel, in order to be able to use it even in these facilities, you, it has a significant carbon footprint that's bigger than renewables. So um, that's the main thing, is, you know, is this risk of nuclear energy, which just doesn't exist at all. I mean, nobody worries about a wind spill at a wind farm, you know. It's because it's not a problem, and, and it never could be a problem. And maybe we never will have a huge catastrophic problem like they did in Japan with Fukushima. Maybe we won't, but maybe we will. You know, Three Mile Island was kind of shrugged about because people say, oh, well, there weren't that many direct deaths, if there were any at all. And like you said with Chernobyl, there were only, how many was it, 60, 64? That's the direct deaths. That's not the people who have developed cancers and other uh, disorders and problems over the continuing decades since it happened. And that has been the same thing that's happened with Three Mile Island, obviously to a much, much smaller effect, because the problem wasn't anywhere near as big as Chernobyl. But that's what is ignored, is those sorts of hidden costs. And so while it may not be as obvious the hidden costs in nuclear as it is with coal, they're still there and they're still more substantial than uh, uh, renewables. Thank you. So at the beginning, I used the example or the analogy of, of antibiotics. And many of you might have thought that was far-fetched. But the reason I wanted to bring up that and the problems with antibiotics is that everything has problems. I mean, think about food. Think about how many foodborne illnesses there are. Yet our attitude toward problems should be, how can we solve them? And yet what you find, I think, with what Ryan is saying and with what an other environmentalists say is that when it comes to certain technologies, all they ever see is problems. And when it comes to solar and wind, all they see is magical safety and things working where they've never worked before. Now, I've suggested that this is an ideological thing, and that's what I want to 
uh, elaborate on. If you think about green energy, what is the definition of green energy? Well, you might say, well, it's, it's clean energy that doesn't have emissions. Well, no, nuclear doesn't really have emissions, and the waste can be stored safely, which I can give you some resources on. Um, uh, and certainly, there's all of this waste with solar and wind, and you're dealing with huge amounts of what are called rare earth metals, which are very toxic. So that doesn't compute either. So what exactly is green energy? And so it seems like it's solar and wind. But then if you look, you'll see, well, what happens when people actually start building large numbers of solar uh, plants and uh, solar farms and wind farms? Well, what they say is, hey, these aren't green. They've got a massive, massive footprint. And what they're talking about is that these plants uh, take up huge, huge, huge amounts of space because their energy source is so dilute. So they're taking up all these wind turbines are taking up huge amounts of space. These solar farms are taking up all these amounts of space. And the, the green energy people, a lot of them say, hey, this isn't what we bargained for. So for instance, in the Mojave Desert, um, you had this big proposed installation. And who was the biggest opponent of it? Environmentalists. In Cape Wind, Massachusetts, a big wind site. Who was the biggest opponent of it? Environmentalists. So what does green energy mean? Well, to understand that, you have to understand what green means. And what green really means is non-impact, minimizing our impact on nature. So, and, and the point is, that is not an ideal that is consistent with producing a lot of energy. Because to produce, to use a lot of energy, you need to A, um, make an impact on nature to produce it. And then B, you need to make a big impact on nature to consume it. And one revealing thing is that in the late 80s, there was this um, idea that we could produce what's called fusion energy, which would be the cheapest, cleanest, safest thing ever and virtually free. And the environmentalists assaulted it. And one of the most famous environmentalists, Paul Ehrlich, said, it's like giving a gun to an idiot child, because what, what we would do with so much energy. So the ideal of green is no impact, low impact. And that means green energy really just means whatever anti-development environmentalists will let you get away with at the time. So even if they tried these plans, the greens would be the first opposing it. So ultimately, green energy means very little or no energy. The questioner is asking Alex to elaborate on how the danger of environmentalism to human life is greater than the danger of industry to human life. Well, I've, I've tried to a bit. I mean, I, I don't know what the danger of industry means. So as I said, everything will have problems. And so there are particular industries and particular companies that will be doing bad things that should be prosecuted by the law, including laws against pollution. But to call industry as such a problem, I mean, industry is the solution to the problem that is human life. Because it's the Industrial Revolution that more than doubled human life expectancy, and again, created the healthiest human environment in history. So there's no problem of industry. Now, the only problem with industry, the primary problem with industry, is anti-industrialism, which I think should be the real name for environmentalism. Because environmentalism implies well, you really care about human beings' surroundings. But as we see with this whole green ideal of not making an impact, they don't want us to improve our environment. They, they want to protect snails and bugs and Stevens kangaroo rats and all kinds of other things that hold up industrial development uh, all the time. So I really regard it as the anti-industrial movement. And what it threatens is everything that industrial civilization has accomplished. So even if, so, as I said, even if solar and wind were practical, environmentalists would be opposed, it, just opposed to it, just like they used to be pro-nuclear. Nothing happened in terms of the facts. Uh, but they stopped calling it green as soon as it became a really major source of energy. Because once it's a major source of energy, it start ha starts having a big footprint. And then all they do is pick on any problem, ignore all the benefits, attack away, and don't hold themselves responsible for the consequences. And if you want one example of this that's outside energy, take the pesticide DDT, uh, which was um, assaulted by the hero of the environmentalist movement, someone named Rachel Carson, who wrote a famous book named Silent Spring. This is something that has saved millions and millions of lives. And because the environmentalists helped get it restricted in different countries, cost tens of millions of lives. So this is a movement with blood on its hands and no apology whenever it destroys something vital industrially. And again, this is because it has this ideal of not impacting nature. And I think that should really make us question that ideal and think of a better ideal, which is to have a healthy human environment. Um, I'm glad Alex just mentioned DDT, because it's probably one of the uh, biggest myths that's being put forward about the environmental movement right now. First of all, DDT was not banned for the use of controlling malaria and mosquitoes. And it's still being used for that today. 
What it was banned in and what Rachel Carson wrote her book about was its use in agricultural pesticides. That is what was banned in this country. It was because this was being used all over crop fields and especially on cotton fields. And it was leading to a lot of environmental problems, specifically if anybody knows anything about DET, the softening of birds' eggshells, and it was leading to the extinction of the bald eagle. So that is what was banned. It was the banning of DDT as used in an agricultural pesticide. And so this idea that Rachel Carson and the environmental movement are to blame for millions or billions of people dying from malaria is a flat outright lie. And it's actually the opposite because what was happening at the time was because it was being used in agricultural processes, resistances in the insect world were developing to DDT. It's kind of like what Alex, what something Alex mentioned earlier about antibiotics. If you know anything about antibiotics, you know that doctors and scientists who are researching it are always having to develop new antibiotics or new strains because the, uh, because the, um, the germs and the bacteria are always evolving and they're adapting to the antibiotics. So you have to make new ones. That was the same thing that was happening with DDT and insects because it was so prevalent in its use in agricultural resources. So actually banning it from that halted the spread of these insects that were resistant to DDT and so it, it allowed it to still be used for purposes of controlling malaria carrying mosquitoes. So actually, if anything, the environmental movement and Rachel Carson helped save millions of lives not led to all their deaths. So it's, I, and I'm sure Alex doesn't intend to be offensive, at least I hope he doesn't, but it is offensive to suggest that one of the most uh, well-known environmental success stories in history is trying to be demonized now in this sense. Um, how much time do I have left? 50 seconds. 50 seconds. Um, so also I'll say, I'll just touch on this issue of environmental connectedness real quick. Um, he talked about how environmentalists are just against all development when it gets big enough. That's not the case. That is NIMBYism. Environmentalists did not oppose the Cape Wind project. They were in full support of it. The people who opposed it were NIMBYists. That's not in my backyard, NIMBY. Those were the rich landowners uh, along the coast there who didn't want to see windmills outside the window even though they wouldn't have. That's who was opposing it, not environmentalists. And this idea that we're just trying to save snails or something, that's completely ignoring the interconnectedness of the environment and our reliance upon it for a healthy way of life. There's a famous environmentalist who likes to pose a hypothetical question, and hypotheticals aren't very useful, but it goes like this. If you have a choice between saving an entire species of bacteria or one human child, what would you choose? Most people choose the child. Well, you just killed all of humanity because that one bacteria is the bacteria that lives in our stomach and allows us to digest food. So before you start making decisions like that and just discounting things because they seem smaller and significant, you should consider the interconnectedness of all life. Thank you. Ryan mentioned that nuclear plants are storing their waste on site. And the questioner is asking why that's a problem. For now, it's not as big of a problem. Of course, try telling that to the people who live around the Fukushima plant in uh, Japan because that was what one of the biggest problems was, was the waste they were storing on site, the cooling ponds drained of their water, and that was one of the biggest problems that happened with it. Now, of course, Alex will probably respond with, well, we don't have the same kind of plants here, and that's true. But that is still a concern. The biggest concern for me is, what happens when those plants get decommissioned? What happens when those plants go offline, and there's no longer an economic interest for the company to keep protecting and preserving that site? They're not going to be held accountable for it. This is what I've been talking about all night. They will not be held responsible for it. We may have laws in place that are trying to make them accountable for it, but they'll just go bankrupt and declare bankruptcy and shovel that cost off onto, once again, us, the public. We are talking about a waste that will be around longer than the pyramids. The pyramids will erode to dust from natural erosion before some of the highest level radioactive waste from nuclear power plants finishes decaying. That is the epitome of placing a burden and a problem on future generations. We're talking about humans probably won't be around still when nuclear waste from these plants is still decaying. So can we figure out a way to get rid of it? Maybe. But is it responsible to continue generating the waste before you have a solution? I don't think it is. What's so bad about nuclear waste? Seriously, I mean, what? What exactly, like, how many of you feel like you have a really good handle? I really want to show of hands on what nuclear waste even means. 
Uh, okay, we got one or two, um, including the one who's learning about nuclear energy in chemistry class. Yeah, I mean, how crazy is that? We're told about it as this huge problem. We're terrified of it. You just say nuclear waste and think of mutants and all this crazy stuff. And I mean, what is nuclear waste? I mean, what is nuclear energy? It's, I mean, it's, it's radioactive. What does that mean? It's just, it's emitting certain things. It's got a lot of energy in it. Uh, it's got these you know, high-speed neutrons. And if you go near it under the wrong circumstances, yeah, it's dangerous. A lot of things uh, are dangerous. And you hear, but so what's, what's the issue? The issue is how to deal with it safely. And one way of dealing with it safely, which unfortunately we have really bad laws about, is what's called reprocessing, which they do much better uh, in France. And so that allows you to use a lot of the energy that could be dangerous to human beings and generate a lot more energy. And that helps make it, it cheaper. And then once you get more and more energy out of it, then it becomes less and less of a threat. And yet there's just, it's treated as this unique thing. And what I propose is what makes people uniquely afraid of it is because we have this green attitude that, well, because it's man-made, because it's having this impact, it's bad. Because if you talk about it's going to last a long time, well, guess what's just as toxic or more toxic and lasts forever? Arsenic. Arsenic has no half-life. So why aren't we mad at Mother Nature for creating arsenic to get us sick? Why are we only mad at human beings for creating nuclear energy. I mean, so with what, and what, what does a long half-life mean? It just means that it takes a long time to decay, so there's not that much radiation at any given time. This is so pseudoscientific, and the reason that we're scared of it is because we've bought into this anti-impact mindset, which is really an anti-technology mindset. It's really saying, if man does something, we should be suspicious of it. I, I wish I could run a parallel experiment where we had the exact same evidence about climate, um, in the exact same patterns, except in one scenario, it was obviously natural, and in one scenario, it was likely man-made, I think people would, would um, be much more hostile to the man-made. Yet, how does that make any sense? Because we get a benefit from the man-made. We produce all this amazing energy that has kept billions of people alive. So there's this real hostility toward when humans do something, when humans change the world, we should be suspicious of it and scared about it. But nature, nature is fantastic. Well, nature's fantastic, but it's also pretty dangerous, and that's why humans should do a lot of changing of it. And when we change it, we are pretty good at doing it safely, and we can always get better. But the problems don't justify banning the technology. The questioner is asking if you could talk about China's solar power industry. How much more do they subsidize than us? What percentage of power are they generating from solar? And can you relate that to the U.S. solar industry? I'm sorry, I don't really have any exact facts and figures for you in my head, um, and I wouldn't want to just spill out some guesses. Um, but I can tell you that the renewable programs in China are far more aggressive than they are here in this country. Um, yes, they are building lots of coal plants, but they're also building lots of solar plants and lots of wind farms as well, and in, at a far more aggressive rate than we are. Pretty much every industrialized country is uh, outpacing us on this and will be surpassing us in renewable development uh, in the future. And to me, that's a really big problem. And especially because in places like China, in developing countries, you have problems like Alex was talking about earlier, where you have communities that suffer these huge externalized costs because they don't have the protections like we have in this country that environmentalists have been working on for decades. So if we really invest in it strongly here, we can develop the technology here and start exporting it to these other countries. We can really uh, revitalize our economy, and that's kind of the point of this whole debate, is by uh, being a world leader in green energy development, especially here in Texas, because uh, where Texas leads, the country tends to follow, and where America leads, the world will tend to follow, as long as it makes sense. And the rest of the world thinks that the green energy revolution makes sense. So that, that's uh, a really good question, and, and I'd recommend people Google it, because I, I, I know the general trend, which I'll talk about in a second, but it's, it's good to know the relative percentages, because the media, which are very uh, favorable toward these, quote, green energies, will be very excited about, oh, China's building all these things, and China's making all this economic progress. But it's making all of its economic progress from coal. The coal is subsidizing uh, the solar, and the solar is comparatively limited. The reason China is pursuing most of these solar things, as against their nuclear ventures, which actually look somewhat promising, is to basically acquiesce to the international community, which wants it to lower, 
what, what it calls its carbon intensity. So China wisely refuses to lower its carbon emissions, but it says, okay, well, a smaller percentage of our energy will come from CO2 in the future. That's the only reason it's doing this. And if we talk about the rest of the world uh, leading, yeah, the rest of the world is, is spending a larger percentage of their money uh, on inefficient energy. So they're giving larger and larger subsidies. So if you look at Spain, I mentioned, uh, that's helping their economy uh, go down the toilet. Um, it's either Germany or Spain. I was reading that the amount of subsidy they give to solar is seven times. They guarantee they're they're so they have so little confidence in the viability of solar as an economic solution that they give seven times the subsidy to solar guaranteed, or seven times the payment to solar energy guaranteed for the next 20 years, uh, if someone will build a solar plant. I mean, what does that say about the potential of this stuff? This so. The idea that the rest of the world is leading, I mean, that's been the justification for so many bad things throughout history. I mean, the rest of the world was leading in socialism, right? Well, we didn't follow that, and we did really well. England did follow that, and it dev devastated itself economically. England has been following the green train a lot more than we have. Go read some news stories about what's happening to their fuel costs, about people being cold, about people, uh, the power not working because it turns out, which and this was a very well-known fact, that wind turbines don't operate too well in extreme cold temperatures. So people have trouble getting heating during the winter. Read what actually happens. So um, as far as I'm concerned, the fact that we're wasting less on these energies is good. But the real threat is not that, not that our money is being diverted toward these um, uneconomic energies, although that is really destructive, especially in a, in, a, in a bad economy. The real threat is they're starting to force them on us. So before, it was what um, energy expert Petter Beckman called rich man's toys. People could feel good about themselves by building a bunch of solar arrays. But that's different than forcing people to use those rich man's toys. Because we're not all rich men, and those rich man's toys only work for a couple of people. But they need to be, uh, they need to be propped up by truly practical sources of energy. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The only three proven practical sources of energy are carbon, um, nuclear, and hydro. The questioner is asking how we should account for Nigeria, where 99% of the population is in poverty, and the 1% that isn't gets money from the oil companies. Yeah, so this is, this is a really important problem. And unfortunately, it's a lot broader than Nigeria. And if anyone wants a reading recommendation on this, there's a book called Oil, uh, Money, Politics, and Power in the 20th Century by a guy named Tom Bauer. He's actually a liberal uh, British reporter. And he did a good job uh, characterizing some of the, the problems that exist uh, in the oil industry. Now, this is a problem both that exists in the oil industry, but primarily with, with uh, you know, Nigeria and the Niger Delta. So the primary problem with Nigeria it, is it has a complete lack of political and economic freedom. And therefore, as long as it has that, along with most of Africa, it is destined uh, for devastation. Now what happens is in some of these countries, so, so the primary way uh, to become wealthy as a country is to have political and economic freedom, which allows you to then be free to build things like energy and have property rights so that individuals can actually benefit from it instead of having it stolen by a bunch of goon dictators. Now what happens is you have these dictatorships which are completely corrupt, and there's a real question of what should American foreign policy be toward it and what should the oil company policy be toward it. And for various reasons, they decide, OK, we're going to deal with these people. You know, sometimes we'll pay them off with various things. And what, what, this, what happens is you see a lot of really bad stuff. But the primary problem isn't the oil. It's that there's not the proper political system so that the oil could be extracted in a way that respects people's rights and so that actually individuals could benefit instead of having this isolated cadre um, of thieves, basically, and then other people. But in terms of, now, I don't want to be too critical of the oil industry producing these countries because the oil is valuable. And it's not like these countries are so much worse off because of, of the oil, necessarily. But uh, I mean, the, the fundamental is what is the political situation in those countries. But there is also a real question of what should the United States government do. So again, take it seriously when I say there are real problems in the world of energy today. And what I'm saying is I want th that world of energy to be freer, and I want us to address those problems. But I do not want us to sacrifice the whole world of energy uh, on the rationalization that, well, there's problems, so we should throw it out. Um, two things about that. One is that, of course, Alex didn't address the point of the question, which was how can you claim that 
oil has been good for everybody and ex extended all their lives when it's destroying people's lives in Nigeria. And his argument was basically that, well, they have this terrible government structure, it's not really the oil company's fault. Well, that's not really the case. And that's kind of what we get to here, that's kind of the heart of the matter, is we now have these huge, massive international corporations that have enormous amounts of power and pull. And yes, that country has a terrible system of government, and hopefully that can change. The oil company is exploiting that, and they are taking advantage of that and encouraging those dictators to behave that way because it maximizes their profits. You think these oil companies want Nigeria to turn into a vibrant democracy in which they will develop environmental regulations and make it harder for them to produce their oil without just dumping their waste into the rivers and lakes? If you really do think that, then you're out of touch with reality. There was, um, I mean, what's the guy's name, Ken? What's his last name, the guy who was killed in Africa? Do you remember his name? There was an activist who was executed because he was an environmental activist who was opposing, I think it was Shell Oil, it was some big oil company. And he was executed not because he was protesting the government, but the government executed because he was leading a resistance against the uh, things that the oil company was doing to his people and to his village and his community. So when we talk about these big corporations that are doing this, I mean, the, and this goes beyond what type of power you're generating, um, but there is something systemic about, again, these externalized costs that are inherent in fossil fuel generation. Because they are there and because the corporations will maximize their profits by keeping them hidden and keeping them externalized, it encourages this innate disregard for the well-being of the poor and the exploited. And they are not going to do anything to reconcile that on their own. The questioner is asking Alex to elaborate on reservoir economics and resource economics that he raised earlier. You, know, there, you hear it with these things like we're running out of oil, we're running out of this, we're running out of that. And it's helpful to look at history and see, wow, people always make those claims and they never come true. Uh, why is that? And the reason why is because of the nature of what a resource is and isn't. So we hear the term natural resources, and we have this image of kind of nature giving us this finite pot of resources, and if we use them too quickly, we're gonna run out, and then you know, the pot's gonna be empty. But that's not how it works at all, actually. Nature just gives us a bunch of raw materials, and as I alluded to before, our natural environment is not particularly pleasant, and that includes, it doesn't give us much wealth. So sure, there's coal in the ground, but it's completely useless to us. It's not a resource. Sure, there's oil in the ground, not useless, it's not useful to us. It, it's, um, it's not a resource. Sure, there's uranium in the ground, which if you know how to exploit it, it turns out that has a million times more energy in it per unit of volume than oil does, but without human ingenuity, it's not a resource. So a resource is really just part of nature's unlimited supply of raw materials, matter, and energy um, converted by the ingenuity of the human mind into some valuable product or service. And that's why, say, if we look at oil, the amount of oil that we have access to keeps expanding. Because what we call oil is really many different types of oils. And over time, human ingenuity figures out how to get more and more and more of it. And not only, so, you know, we used to not be able to get um, oil from deep areas. Now we can. We used to not be able to get it from tar sands. Now we can. Um, now, there are definitely environmentalist objections to that. They think it's bad. I think it's good. Uh, we probably won't have time to finish that one up today. But, Go to industrialprogress.net and you can hear my opinion uh, on Keystone. But in any case, uh, so the world is just this ball of potential resources that human ingenuity uh, can, can actualize. And of course, any given one, you might, it might be that there's not enough, you know, that you start dwindling. But what happens then is the price goes up and then human ingenuity finds something else. So with oil, you know, we're, it's hard to tell. It seems like mostly government interference is what's keeping the, the price of oil up. But either way, there's no kind of tragedy if the price goes up, you know, you're quote running out. Well, the price goes up, you start using something different, which is supposedly what the environmentalists uh, want anyway. So the human mind is the ultimate resource. And so when you hear any claim about dwindling resources, you have to remember if the mind is free, we have more and more resources. The more we consume, the more we produce, the more we have. 
I completely agree with the statement about human ingenuity and utilizing what resources are available to us. I forget the exact analogy, but it's something like enough sunlight hits the United States in one hour to power it for a year. So why aren't we using our ingenuity to further develop solar technologies? I completely agree with that and think we should do that. Now, the, the issue with oil, and let me be very clear, when I say that fossil fuels are running out, I don't mean that we're ever going to get to the point where, like, we've got a big hole in the ground and we're sucking oil out of it, and then all of a sudden, you know, like slurping on a straw, it goes dry, and there's no more oil. We're never going to reach that point, because there will oil, always be oil that we just can't get to, or that we at least can't get to economically. That is the entire point. It's how much oil is there that is economically recoverable, and that is what the idea of peak oil is. And we've already reached peak oil. You know how I can say that with utter certainty? Gas prices are going up. Why do you think they're going up? It's not because we have an abundance of oil. It's not because we're finding new reserves of oil that are driving the price down. That would be, you know, one argument to keep doing oil. But the whole reason why the tar sands is being developed isn't because we didn't know about it or didn't know, or didn't know how to process it. It's because the price of oil has increased enough to the point where it's economically feasible to use tar sands as an energy source. Before now, before peak oil, it wasn't economical enough. But the problem is, is this is more than just an e economical question. This has to be about more than just who can make, turn a profit at doing this. That should not be the sole driving force behind everything we do as a society, is who can make money at it. Not when there are such significant externalities to it. You know, if, if global warming didn't exist, if there weren't so many, you know, bad effects from pollution with, from fossil fuels, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't be here talking to you about this. I would say, yeah, go ahead. Drill for as much oil you want. You know, do as much as you want. But the fact of the matter is, is that's not the case. We have these huge externalities, and we, just ignoring them because a bunch of large international corporations can continue to make a huge, massive, embarrassingly large profit at the expense of other people and at the expense of everybody else's resources is completely irresponsible. The questioner is asking if any of the technological advancements of the Industrial Revolution were developed, manufactured in mass, and used without the vast increase of power production by fossil fuels. Well, again, that's not the heart of the issue. It's not that, of course, we needed energy to develop a lot of those innovations. But saying that the only way to generate our energy is fossil fuels is the problem. It's not the only way we have to generate our energy. In fact, it wasn't the only way we had to generate our energy back then. Um, a guy named Nikola Tesla, hopefully most of you have heard of him, he invented electricity for all intents and purposes. <laughs> Uh, he said that if we continue to use fuel to get our power, we are living our, on our capital and exhausting it rapidly. This method is barbarous and wantonly wasteful and must be stopped in the interest of coming generations. And he said that in 1915. So this is the guy who invented electricity, saying that we needed to stop using fuel to get it. He was a huge proponent of renewable systems, and he was a huge proponent of being aware of the costs of what we were doing to society. So that is my point. My point is that, because what Alex was trying to say is that all of the credit for the advancement of human civilization and, and extended life is the credit of fossil fuels. And I just don't see that. I don't see how you can just give all that credit to fossil fuels. That's, that, that's all I was saying with that. So in most realms of life, we recognize that there's a big difference between actually doing something and saying that you can do it or saying that you could have done it or promising that you'll do it in the future. And that can be a life and death difference uh, if the issue is a big enough deal. So Tesla is an amazing guy, um, but he did not figure out how to efficiently convert solar and wind energy into usable energy, nor has anyone since. It is true that there is an enormous amount of energy in nature, including from the sun and the wind, more for practical purposes than we can ever imagine using. But what we have to understand is that it is an incredible achievement to convert any of that energy into usable power. That's why it took until 200 years ago to even have one method of doing this efficiently, 
and we only have three now. Now, why don't we get our energy from hurricanes? Because after all, there's more energy in a hurricane than the world needs for an entire year. Well, because it's really hard to solve this problem of efficient energy conversion. And so when we're dealing with this, and when the stakes are so high, the only thing that we can rely on is prove it. Can you actually do it? And if you say, I haven't proven it, or I've proven it, but you don't accept it as proof, it's somehow proof, even though I haven't, I've never produced industrial scale energy cheaply for an entire society, and you're talking about massive bans and restrictions on what actually works, that is, that is just so deadly. So again, there's a difference between what works and what people pretend will work, or what they make up. And I really only care about what works, because that, that's what keeps me alive, and because fossil fuels keep me alive today, nuclear keeps me alive today, hydro keeps me alive today, I'm profoundly grateful to everyone in those industries uh, for doing that. And I think it's really, really bad that people will take the necessary difficulties and challenges of any energy industry um, and use those to try to destroy the only energies that have actually made this incredible achievement of producing the power that's doubled my life expectancy and made my life just have far more potential and all of your lives have far more potential than just about any life in human history ever could. So one of the phrases that Alex used before was calling solar rich men's toys. Well, cars were rich men's toys at one point too. Again, this is all about the economy of scale. This is a fairly new technology in the sense that it has not been adopted on a large industrial scale. But that's not because it doesn't work. And it's, it's very refreshing to sit here and not have to debate climate change deniers or something like that. And it's very nice that Alex acknowledges that's, that it is real and that it does exist. But he is a denial in another sense, and that is in the sense of saying that there is no alternative. Because it is proven. You can go and see it for yourselves. It does work. There are whole countries that are powered on renewable energy alone. It's called Iceland. Now, granted, Iceland is much, much smaller than the United States. I'm not suggesting we could do the same thing here. But it is an example of how, a, of how an entire country is powering itself on practically 100% renewable energy. It's hydro and geothermal. So this idea that it's somehow impossible is just flat out wrong. And also this, this sort of doomsday scenario where where Alex envisions through government regulations us shutting off all the fossil fuel plants and us being plunged into a, a blackout of, uh, and dark age of, of no electricity. That's just not going to happen. If, if we are not able to literally do the innovation that is necessary to build the infrastructure of renewable energy to switch over to that, they're not going to shut down the power plants. They're not going to do it. Even if we wanted them to, they wouldn't do it. So that's not going to happen. But I don't see the logic in simply denying that all these technologies exist and saying, let's just keep doing business as usual because we know it works, even though we know it's causing these huge, massive problems, and even though all these folks over here who have proven that these technologies work are trying to get the job done and trying to replace this dirty and inefficient source of power with something better. That's all I have to say. Lots of fun, lots of issues uh, discussed. We went all over the place from you know nuclear waste to uh, to peak oil. Um, again, both of us you know write and talk about these things, so please check out our resources uh, on the internet. I said at the beginning that I wanted to get across three ideas tonight, so I'm going to really end by repeating those. The first is that the green energy movement isn't trying to outcompete our leading sources of energy; it's trying to ban them, and we see that they won't accept a scenario in which all subsidies are just banned. Um, they, and they demand that, there are, you know, that we have these big bans. Now you can say, oh, we won't go through with them if it turns out to be impractical. Well, you lose a, that's a lot of destruction along the way, and I don't really trust uh, that kind of, of sentiment in the first place. It seems that the policy that would make sense is to have no bans, and if all of these technologies have so much promise, and I hope I hope that all the evidence is contradicted and that they do have all of this promise, then they'll be great and then we'll all be happy. So get the ban, like um, table the ban option. Get the ban option off the table. Compete on a real market. Now the second idea was that our leading sources of energy, whatever their problems, are economically and environmentally indispensable. And this 
for me is the most important point because it's really a point about the nature of energy. Again, energy is what stands between us and pre-industrial times. It's what does all, basically all of the work for us in the world. So it is absolutely something that you can never take for granted. And you can never, as I said before, um, evade the difference between what's actually working and what is not. And by the way, anyone that says they're powered by so-called renewables, that's kind of a packaging because the green energy people are largely uh, big opponents of hydro. And hydro is a, quote, renewable that, of course, I endorse because it's extremely uh, practical, although it's, it's limited in terms of, of locations. So again, we have to value energy, and that means that we really value what works, and we appreciate it. And to the extent there are problems, we try to solve those problems. But we do not propose banning them in the name of uh, those problems, because banning them is a billion times worse than any of those problems could ever be. Now, the third idea is that support for green energy is rooted in ideology, not economics or science. And I think this is, comes across in the, just the obsession with solar and wind, despite the history of these things being extremely expensive and extremely unreliable. This is purely an ideological obsession. There's no economic uh, basis for this. The economic basis, as I said before, is the evidence from the 1970s when nuclear was the freest it's ever been, although still not all that free, where nuclear was out competing coal on price. Nuclear is the practical clean energy, and environmentalism opposes it because uh, it is not green in the sense of it's making an impact on nature. It's fundamentally dealing with all these radioactive things which environmentalists find offensive. And the fact that this ideology is getting in the way of us having practical energy, the fact that literally billions of lives are on the line, and the fact that literally those billions of lives would be shorter today if we had followed the advice that, that we've heard from the green side, that should give us pause and that should really make us question the whole idea of going green. And that's why uh, you know, I work uh, for the Center for Industrial Progress because we believe that industrial progress should be the new ideal. Industrial progress means what we care about is the human environment. That comes first and that's the only way to a truly prosperous and happy future.